morning, everyone. I hope you had a fantastic day and a half so far, and a very warm welcome to you today. Um, just getting out of the meditation session that I was having at the backstage, I hope you enjoyed it. Very happy to be moderating this panel today with two very successful leaders working in male-dominated industries. Amira Sajwani, the Managing Director of the MAC Sales and Development, and Pakinam Kafafi, the CEO of Taqa Arabia. I would like to ask first the panelists to introduce themselves, and then we start our panel. Pakinam, I would love to start with you. Um, before I introduce myself, uh, uh, seriously, I would like to thank uh, Forbes Middle East uh, for such an amazing summit. It was really inspiring, hearing stories, especially from young generation, how they make it, and uh, it was a great network. If I introduce myself, I always like to introduce myself as uh, I'm Pakinam Kafafi. I'm a mother of two kids, amazing kids, uh, Layla and Omar, and I'm uh, the CEO of Taka Arabia. It's uh, the largest private sector uh, energy uh, company in Egypt, and uh, currently we, we are or we hoping that we're growing out of Egypt in different other countries in Africa and the Middle East. Thank you, Pakinam. Amira? Well, thank you, Forbes, for having us, and thank you, Huda, for being here today with us on stage. Um, I'm Amira Sajwani. I'm the Managing Director of Sales and Property Development at Damak Properties. Uh, we are the largest private developers in the UAE and have our footprint across more than six countries. And I'm a proud Emirati daughter, sister, wife, and recently mother of two. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Isn't that impressive? I don't want to reveal your age, but I heard from the back doors that you're super young. <laughs> God bless. Amira, you were born into a family of business, okay? Focused mainly on real estate, which again is largely male-dominated industry. I understood that you are also having a male-dominated family. Tell us more about that and your experience and how did this shape Amira that we see today, the confident young lady that took the position of the managing director of the, uh, of the sales and uh, development? So I did grow up in a very male-dominated house. I have three brothers. Uh, but I think that actually helped shape my personality very much. Not only because my father, being a very strong father, he never differentiated between us. He didn't have gender, he had ability. He pushed us all equally and he set the bar of expectations across all of us equally. Um, and that dominoed onto my brothers as well, of not seeing me as a girl or a woman, but just seeing me as an equally capable sibling. Uh, and having an older brother who was, uh, let's say, I think he wanted a brother rather than a sister, so he treated me like a brother in terms of the way we interacted, the way we spent time, the way we, he bullied me. And I think that <laughs> helped shape my personality quite a bit. Um, but it's definitely, it was very helpful to have a supporting environment and the father who pushed me to be the best that I can be regardless of gender. Fantastic. Pakinam, you are on the list of the most powerful women in the Middle East by Forbes for quite some time now. Very successful woman, the first CEO in Egypt, which is a very large country, 110 million of population in the energy sector. So tell us about your journey and how did you reach there? Well, if I start with the journey, I, uh, I started, uh, I graduated 19 years old, uh, major economics. I started with working in an investment house, uh, and I'm so proud of it, the EFGMS, uh, where we learned a lot about different industries and uh, uh, understanding the investment and understanding a lot from economics and business uh, sense. But I always had passion regarding energy because my dad uh, used to work in BP. So energy for me, I always say that energy is lung, the lung of a human. You cannot live without energy. So for me, it was a passion where I decided one day I wake up, I, I don't want to work as an investment banking anymore. I want to go into details. I want to understand the energy field. So in I, I, 2003, I joined uh, Toka. 
and uh, Taka was created to be uh, a one-stop energy solution. And I started as an investment and become the CEO in 2016. 2006, I mean. Um, the thing is, uh, the energy uh, is, is a very interesting field because the diversity in, in energy is, is great. The technology g getting into it because, uh, and going into sustainability is getting great. Every single day you have something new in energy, whether it's in, in the fuel itself, going from diesel to uh, gas to uh, renewable hydrogen. So it's so interesting because there is an impression that energy is a boring field, which is not true. It's, it's really interesting, and when you work hard and you understand what, 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 what it's all about and how you can tackle everything and move with the technology, you will be able to be succeed. And, and we, as Toka, we, we like to serve our, our clients. We, we, we achieve the efficiency for them, and this is way, why we, we, we managed to be the first in, in Egypt in the energy field. Fantastic. We'll talk and, and we'll touch upon sustainability in a while. I would just ask uh, the organizers to show us the time so that we don't miss the time. Just as a check, please. Thank you. Amira, your father was an entrepreneur. And I understood also that your grandparents were also entrepreneurs. What about you, Amira, the young um, leader at the moment? Do you have something in mind that you can share today with the ladies here in the room and the gentlemen? So actually, I just launched my PropTech a few months ago. Uh, and the PropTech is focused on digitizing the journey of an uh, individual as well as a uh, broker or a mediator in a real estate transaction. Uh, I think technology is coming across all industries. And property might be one of those industries that is so brick and mortar that it might be a bit more difficult for it to catch up in terms of digitization. But I think today people are looking at property and real estate in a, in a much broader sense of technology and are able to take that step forward. Um, and I've always been very interested in how the scalability of real estate can be massive across the globe uh, if digitized and taken in a different direction. And even in terms of energy, energy comes in in terms of smart home enhancement and integration through mobile applications that allow people to control energy usage while not at home, while at home. Uh, I mean, my husband is a huge buff of uh, having everything digitized in our house, to the extent sometimes I'm freezing, but I don't know how to switch off the AC. <laughs> uh, so I think that will also domino into environmental saving and energy saving in the future. Yeah. It's amazing how technology can play a very good role to help us digitally transform to be sustainable. Sustainability is key at the moment. Uh, I believe that COP28 uh, would take further what we have uh, seen in COP27 in Egypt and Sharm el-Sheikh to the next level. I'm sure that it will happen. And everyone is talking about sustainability, even in the energy field. I recall, actually, that we, uh, there was an article that was featured with the Minister of uh, um, uh, Petroleum and Mineral Resources, uh, His Excellency Engineer Tariq Mullah, talking about how he's transforming and the, 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 the energy sector in, uh, in Egypt. Pakinam, I would love to hear from you. What are the plans when it comes to sustainability? Because there was a lot of attacks to the, uh, to the energy companies that they are polluting the uh, environment. But now there are so many initiatives inside any organization to take this towards a sustainable uh, execution. So tell me about what you think of Ataka Arabia. What are you doing to help change the narrative from that perspective? Well, um, yani five years ago, if you were talking about sustainability, I remember I went to a client and I'm trying to explain to him how we can go green and he told me I don't know green except dollar. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and, and you can see how it is difficult to make people aware about green and sustainability. But now I can see the change. I can see that people are aware what is the problem, what's happening on Earth, that we have no solution. And also the technology and the R&D and making all the, the uh, investments in green become cheaper and cheaper made it lucrative finally and make uh, our clients listen. What we do in Taka is basically, as I told you, we concentrate in moving with the, the best technology ever 
and also aware that green is, is a must now and we have to transform all our clients into green as much as we can. So as I told you, when we started, it was diesel, then it was gas, and we still we have 1.7 million customers in gas. However, we are trying to switch as much as we can into green. We are making decarbonization every year and we're counting on increasing it. We're having renewable projects. We're studying hydrogen projects. We're having water desalination with renewable. And our first uh, project is going to be in, a, in, in one of the largest resorts in Egypt called Suma Bay, where we're going to make a desalination with solar, which is, I think, it's step by step. Am I, as an energy expert, think that we can go green as fast as everybody is announcing? Uh, in my perspective, I think it will take a, a longer time. Not only because of the awareness, it's because there are still industries, heavy industries, that you cannot work 100% hydrogen. It is not, uh, 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 or, I mean green and uh, uh, with a full 100% sustainability in order to make it. But we start with hybrid. We're making a hybrid. I can make in the, uh, in the morning uh, renewable, at night uh, I can use gas. As much as we can, we, uh, petroleum products, we, we get less and less. It, it's becoming more green and green. Uh, our clients, uh, we have different clients. We have touristic clients, we have real estate clients. Most of the real estate clients are aware now of energy efficiency. We're trying to provide them with a mix how uh, panels, panels even uh, uh, on the rooftops, we're trying to create as much as they can. And sustainability is not only green, it's the diversity and it has Correct. a lot of uh, inclusion. So this is what we do also in Taka. We have currently 20% of the leaders women. I cannot uh, deny that it's still a, a low percentage, but you have to understand that energy is a male dominated uh, sector. Uh, and it's coming from both. A woman doesn't like to work in energy a lot, and it was always seen as a male-dominated, which is now changing a lot. No, I fully agree, and I have to reveal that the first meeting that I had with you, uh, Pakinam, in my former capacity, right? So we were waiting for the woman CEO to come to have a discussion, yeah? And, uh, and also, I work in, in the technology, information technology, which is another male-dominated industry. But what I love here is that what I hear from both of you, that you have been, if I may say, gender-blind. So this male-dominated industry or uh, did not really... Um, stop you from going to the next level. It did not uh, irritate you. At least for me, I was never irritated. Actually, I discovered it only when I looked at one of the pictures and I found that I was the only woman in this picture. And then I started to relate that, wow, you know, it makes sense that working in male-dominated industries is quite different. Amira, I would like to go to you in your capacity as the managing director and the daughter of the founder of the Mac. How do you believe you can drive change from a sustainability angle not only inside of the MAC, but to lead it in the country and moving towards uh, global change? I think two big advantages that I have are one, of course, being the daughter of the founder. The views are taken more seriously. You're on the table of decision making and you're able to ha bring a different perspective of compassion and sustainability to the table. I think women in general have a longer view of let's say the future, because most of us are mothers and we think of our children. I must admit, before having kids, I didn't think of sustainability as much. Now, when I think of my kids and their future, sustainability is always a factor that comes in. So I think being at the decision-making helm of the company is definitely an advantage that allows uh, me and other women in my position to bring that aspect. But I think in general, being in real estate is a big factor because real estate itself is a huge contributor to sustainability, future energy efficiency, ESG initiatives, uh, making even integrating solar panels and solar initiatives from the start of a project so that at the point of delivery and the point of use, those factors have already been accounted for. It's not a matter of a project or development or, or half the country is already built on non-energy efficient uh, initiatives, but those are things that today need to be taken into account for the future of tomorrow. Uh, and they need to be looked at from a point of inception and the point of actual architects 
perspective from day one, not to be integrated later on in the journey. So I think being able to control, and I have the development arm under me, I manage the development arm, so being able to control what we put into the market today will have a huge impact on what is delivered tomorrow. Fantastic. I was reading a book and the book uh, was saying that the more you go up, the more it becomes lonely. So I wanted to get from your experience how you manage this loneliness if you ever feel that it's lonely at the top and how to get the support system around you, whether from inside the organization or outside, to drive change. So, Pakinam, I would like to start with you. And I will be honest, I, uh, I never felt lonely. Fantastic. <laughs> Why? Because I, uh, in, in, whole, in my whole career, I never had the issue of uh, women and men. Uh, all the people I was working with and my bosses, they never differentiated between a man and a woman. It's all about hard working, who is, who is doing the work, who is doing the task in the right way. So I never had this problem. Also, I've been raised in a family where uh, man, woman, we all been treated uh, the same uh, in a, in same community, family. So for me, uh, sitting in a table with all men, I handle. I'm all actually I'm the louder voice. Yani, they are the one who's intimidated, not me. <laughs> yani, yani, I, I, I'll be frank. <laughs> No problem, I love it. Amira, what about you? I think I agree with a lot of what Pakenham said. I think um, for me, the same situation of growing up in a house full of boys, it never bothered me to be the girl at the table. Uh, but I think it's very important to have a strong support system. Uh, and all of the men in my life are very supportive of the fact that even if I'm a young mother, you know, my father, he always tells me, he said, you know, I know a woman who got back into the office three days after giving birth, so what's your excuse? And I tell him, you know, I just had your first granddaughter. And he says, yeah, but you have a company to run. So I think also having that differentiation to be treated like anybody else, not the differentiation of you're a woman or a man, I think that needs to be encouraged more. Um, it's like, you know, it's like uh, Seema said yesterday, we shouldn't be seen as women leaders, but just leaders. It should be a situation of you are a leader, or you are a manager, or you are an employee, or you are an entrepreneur, but you're not a woman entrepreneur or a woman leader. You're just yeah. there to do the job or the initiative or the task that you want to achieve. I fully agree with this uh, comment and I, I also liked it when Simi mentioned it. And uh, the more we talk about equality, women equality, it means that we're not yet there. Exactly. So thank you so much for bringing this topic. Sometimes when uh, a topic is being brought up still, yeah, I know that you both say that you don't feel that it's d really different uh, in your role, whether a woman uh, or, a, uh, or a man, but sometimes getting a topic that might be a little bit itchy for the people around you. I know that you said also that you are the louder voice, but how do you get people persuaded around the topic of impact that you see, but maybe others around you do not see as a priority? Do you lean in or what's your style? See, I learned in my life that you have to choose your battles. So, for example, if I, if, I, if I go to the board and I'm trying to convince them with several projects and I know that which ones that I will, the company will benefit more, I'll, I'll always put my weight on, 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 on these uh, projects. However, uh, um, whether a man or a woman, you need to have your full study, full awareness, full KPIs, full full uh, uh, aspects of anything you re need to represent in, or in order to be able to convince the people. And you have to always make, uh, understand the people around you. And of course, if you're in a board, and uh, you, you know them by time, uh, you know wh how you will be able to convince Hoda, how you will be able to convince. So you tackle this, it's, in a leadership, it's not only about hard work, or you're making your work in a, in a great, it's tactics, strategy, and how to be able to convince people. And this you will take by time. Yani, of course, there are people who are born talented by this, but Anna, for me, it was by practice. Uh, I, was, I was loud, as you said. Now I know how, when I will be, be, be loud, when I can make tactics. Uh, things sometimes comes by experience and by, by being wise. 
And Pakinam, you mentioned uh, the topic of being on board, and I would like actually to take it to the next level. So being the CEO of a company is one thing, but being recognized as well from the market with the seniority, to be invited to sit on board is something that is completely different. And the persuasion level and the objection handling would require a completely different style. Can you share with us being on the board of a couple of entities? Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm on a board of a couple of entities. Uh, there are three types. Uh, one, non-profitable organizations, where uh, uh, these boards is either, I'm example, in, I'm the board of the school of my kids. Just to understand how they are educated, uh, uh, just to get a bit little less guilty to understand what they are doing. And uh, there is non-profitable also as a CSR and, and things to be good for the community. Also, I'm on a board in several industries completely different than mine. And the reason I am in these boards, I always, when somebody approach me, I tell him, tell me the details. Because there are two things in order to be approving being in this board. I have to add value, and you have to add me value. So it's not me only to add value to this board. I need to learn. Nobody stop learning. So Anna, for me, if, if this board will gain, uh, give me value, make me understand new industries, help me in uh, understanding industries that might be my clients, so I understand how I can provide them with energy efficiency, you know. And at the same time, I give my, my value from energy perspective, from investment background perspective. Uh, and I'm currently in one of the board, even the, head, the president of uh, the audit committee. And because I love numbers, so it's, for me, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a plus and I enjoy it. Fantastic. Amira, I would like to go back to your learning journey yeah? and how you, what you studied, what you learned, whether formally through an official learning track or informally through the experiences that you got, whether you're planning to be on board. You said that you started already. You have your own startup as an entrepreneur. How is this impacting the way you think and the way you set priorities? Just before you answer that, sorry, ladies, you are out of time. So if you could just wrap this up, that would be fabulous. Thank okay, you. sure. We're missing the time here, actually. So thank you for reminding us. No problem. But we'll take this question and then we wrap up. So I actually, I studied uh, five years in London across different real estate and finance degrees. But what I think I've learned the most is that your education doesn't really take you far. I think whatever you will learn, you will learn on the ground. You'll learn by rolling up your sleeves and actually getting into the details and the f problems of what is happening right under you. And that's the only way to learn. And I think that falling and getting up and falling and getting up is how you'll actually end up growing and learning. And launching my prop tech for me was another way for me to dive into the growth because in a family business, when a business is too large, there's only so much you can learn on a daily basis because you're so busy firefighting every issue that comes up every day. Whereas when you're building something from scratch, you have that learning curve ability to be able to start from zero because the zero to one, I think, is where you learn the most. And everything beyond that is an open book of every day dealing with a different issue to learn and grow from that issue itself. So I think education is very important, but I think if I could tell my two daughters something, it would be just get your hands into something, anything. It doesn't have to be necessarily the business line that we as a family are in, but anything that they are passionate about, start doing it. And when you start doing it, every day you're gonna learn something new about it. Whether it's a sport, a passion, a business, a startup, an education, and CSR initiative, it really doesn't matter. But if you give your all into something, you'll learn something on a daily basis. Thank you so much. And this is a very nice closure for the panel from your side. This advice not only for your daughter, but if I may, share it with the floor. Pakinam, what would you close the session with? With one advice or a couple of advices very quickly. I think uh, from yesterday I heard people say we're lucky, I said, people say that we're talent. I think uh, if, you're, if you know what you want and you work hard for it, you will reach somewhere. The, the, the lucky, the talent, uh, smartness, they are add up, but nobody work hard and they don't reach what they want. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Forbes Middle East, you. for such an inspiring event. Thank you, Khulud Al-Amyan. Thank you for the Forbes team in the 
and the whole session here and the whole experience. Thank you, Your Highness, for joining us again and for supporting this event. Thank you and looking forward to have the coming event in Saudi next year. Have a great morning. Yes.